Hi everyone, welcome to the Mount Sunapee Virtual Fair and our demo for the day is going to be mugs. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoy. Uh, we have uh, the virtual fair is going on all the way from Saturday, this last Saturday, all the way till what's the day? Nine. The ninth. Sorry, folks, I have been having way too much fun at home. Um, and so let's get started, and we'll talk along the way. I'm making one pound mugs and I am using a electric potter's wheel and the potter's wheel has been around forever and what I will start with is a very centering my clay now if you have questions I don't have a problem of you asking at any time during the demo um, and if there becomes too much silence which no potter would ever do um, let me know and I'll continue to talk so I've centered my clay and I'm flattening it out to open it up to find the bottom of the clay all potters have different methods, but a lot of them are very, very similar. Now I have a needle tool that is brand new. What you can't use that one. Ah, needle tool. And I'm going to measure the bottom to see how thick it is. Over time, potters get a good feel for the depth of the clay. So we don't have to worry so much about measuring the clay base. Now I've just pulled up the first wall, and now I'm going to pull up the second wall. And I'm using my fingertips, and I have a sponge that I'm running behind my fingertips because I want to feel the clay so I know how thick it is. Uh, when I, I teach a class up in Portland and my students always ask me why I want them to have the clay and the sponge behind my fingertips because they like to have the clay wet. And I say you need to feel the thickness of your pot. Now I'm going to pick up a rib and I'm going to start to smooth the exterior of my mug. In the very, very far background, you're going to see some mugs here that are round. And that's the shape that I'm working towards to make today. Now the director of this wonderful program today, to give credit to everybody it's here, is Maureen Mills, who is my wife, and also the director of today's program. Her assistant, who is walking into the frame a little bit, if you can see him, is Cobalt, who is our dog, who is a 10, almost a 10-year-old girl. Oh, I know, I'm talking about your age. I'm sorry. I know. And she's a hound, so she has these great looks. Now that I've made the shape, I'm going to clean out the water from the inside so that I don't break the pot down. I'm also going to clean up the edge, look at the surface of the pot, look at the um, roundness, do any corrections I need, and then take another rib or a knife and I'm going to cut a 45 degree angle underneath to remove any of the excess of clay that is flat to the surface. Because what I'm going to do here is pick up my mug and move it over to my wear board. 
which is where my tankard's sitting over here. I'm going to clean off, wipe my hands off, and then I'm going to pick, twist, and lift. So that's the first mug. Most potters work in multiples. Uh, my favorite statement I ever heard was, I work in threes, and threes can work to twelve, which would be a dozen. Not that I've ever heard that statement before. I love talking to my students, and when with my students, they like working in threes, sevens, odd numbers, uh, but never in twelve. Uh, it's a long way off. But they're a lot of fun because the thing is, they inspire me to look at my work and see how I'm making it. Um, and how I finish the piece and how the bottoms look and everything. Because when you make pots, and this will be an ongoing continuous theme, is you need to know from the very beginning to the very end what the pot is going to look like when it kind of comes out of the kiln. That doesn't mean things don't happen along the way that change it. Uh, the kiln's gl uh, glazes, which are fired to 2,350 degrees Fahrenheit, will definitely change it. And we do what is called reduction firing. So reduction firing is, is where we starve the kiln of its oxygen by pushing in the damper in the chimney. And that will change the color of our glaze. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, just a gentle reminder that if you have a question, please feel free to ask. Uh, if I don't have an answer, the director may have an answer. And we can go from there. Uh, also, I, if you are going to have a question, you can write it into chat, uh, and that's where I will find, Maureen will find it. Also, we are on a kind of time delay, so when you write it in, it will be a few minutes before I answer your question, and you get to that. So now again, the same thing. I've made the mug. I've looked at the shape. I'm going to just alter that edge here just a little bit. Use the knife. Go underneath. And cut it. Now, this is 30 years of making pots. So when people see potters who throw for a very long time, it looks simple and it looks like we're not, it, it shouldn't take this long or it should be longer. When you first start out, you can spend up to 15 minutes to 20 minutes making one pot. Over time, you start to learn how to make the pot quicker, but also your hands get what's called muscle memory, so that you can actually make the pot and remove it. So the thing is, we learn over time, and it's repetition. So the more you do something over and over again, it's like watching my electrician or my accountant working and they seem to work very quickly at getting the numbers, they pull the wires, they hook it up, and we all get very confused how they can do it so well. Well, if you do it every single day, you get really fast at something. So, again, this is going to be quite a few mugs. I got about 24 of them wedged up. So, you're going to watch me start this, 
And one of the things about my mugs is, like I said, I put a surface design on them. So that surface design is done with liquefied porcelain clay. Now porcelain clay is the primary clay of all clays. And we mix it up with a few other things to make it into a liquefied slip that's like heavy cream. Now that heavy cream is put into a bottle that is called a trailing bottle and we draw on the surface to get all the designs that you see. Now once I get the designs on the surface, I will let the pot dry and it becomes what we call greenware. Now a greenware pot is fragile, they break easily. They're kind of grayish in color for me. They can also be red, they can be white if they're made out of a porcelain clay. But I use a stoneware clay, so mine are kind of grayish in color. Now once they get completely dry, I will load them into a bisque kiln I have an electric kiln. You can use any kiln that you own if you're a potter, and they all fire them in those kilns to bisque fire them. And a bisque fire is to 1,750 degrees Fahrenheit for me. And that is what earthenware flower pots would be made to. The ones that break really easily. Now at that point, they come out and I'm going to glaze it and then load it back into a kiln. And a glaze, by the way, is uh, clays and oxides mixed with water and you dip the pot in that solution or you can have a spray booth and you spray them or as some people like to do is brush it on. I like the dipping method. Now once I have dipped the pot into that solution of the mixture, they come out looking like a piece of chalk, and then I load them back into another kiln, and I fire them up to the 2,350 degrees Fahrenheit. Now at that point, they are solid and vitrified, and they will be functional to use in today's modern conveniences. Okay, there we go. Each pot has a little variation in it. No two pots are ever the same. So if you're looking at handmade wares, they will be different. There will be a mark that will be different. Even if I copied the same design and I use a trailing bottle, I use a stamp, I use wires to make curly cue things on mine or spirals, every time I put it on, it has a different look. So no two are ever alike, no matter how hard I try. Now, if I made a stencil and I spent 15 years becoming a master stencil maker and learned how to put them on, I could make a copper plate, a zinc plate, or I could use my computer today and make a plate out of that and print them. They would all be the same. If I made a mold using uh, plaster or clay to make a mold, all my pots would look the same. I like the irregularities of me. Um, I love straight lines. Um, my pots, I work really hard to make straight lines, but I do not always get there uh, because I draw without a ruler. And by the way, if you think you need a ruler to make a straight line, uh, nobody makes a straight line without a T-square. Only if you are that lucky to have that great ability. But do I like straight lines? Oh yeah, they're really fun.
Just another gentle reminder, if you do have questions, they don't always have to be about the pottery. It can be about my dog even. I'm not afraid to talk about her. She's quiet, peaceful, and understanding. She always goes outside. When we call her, she comes immediately to us like every hound does, you know. And I am just kidding. She looks at you. She's smelling something. She looks up, turns, and looks at you and says, I'll be right there in a minute. Kyle, who's a potter in Connecticut and a former student, is trimming his bowl while he's watching. Oh, cool. Hi, Kyle. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm glad that you're making pots, and I hear you were one of Maureen's students. So congratulations on being a potter, uh, and welcome. Also, if you have been a former one of Maureen's former students, if I say something different than Maureen has said, let me know. We will get it corrected. If I agree, I will correct it. If I disagree, we'll have a disagreement, and then we'll have a great discussion going, which could also be fun. Again, more of the shaping. I was once told when I was an apprentice, I started my pottery at a theme park in Branson, Missouri. I was working at a place called Silver Dollar City. And that is where I started learning how to make pots. I also went to school at a place called Arkansas State University, Jonesboro, Arkansas. And I believe my Maureen looked up once and my professor was still there, Bill Rowe. Uh, that is great. And if he ever hears about this, this will be even more fun. Uh, he taught me a lot. He helped me get through college. Uh, professors are really good people. They help us through our education. But at Silver Dollar City, one of the fun things that I learned was don't ever drop the master potter's pots. I got to be the apprentice, so I got to carry everybody's pots and load them in the kilns and unload the kilns. And if anybody's ever been to Silver Dollar City, you know that at the time in the 80s, they were letting the public run right across from where our kilns were. So we would run out into the public who were running to get somewheres. It was fun. And I really enjoyed it. But I learned a lot about how pottery is made. So, so far so good. They're all a little bit different, but they all look the same. The hardest thing to teach or learn as a potter is repetition. We like to think that one making one object gives you everything you want. But even Monet, who painted wonderful paintings, um, I think he was the guy with the haystacks, over and over and over and over to show the light of a haystack all in one day or over several days. It's repetition and you learn how to do and make your objects. Again, I'm going to just smooth off the bottom, but I'm also compressing the bottom of the pot so that when the pot is taken off, it won't get a hairline fracture in the bottom. It's one of the fun things potters have to deal with. And by compressing the clay, you hopefully get rid of that. Can it still happen? As my students love me when I say to them, we'll find out. There's never an answer completely to 
everything is going to work. That's the fun of it. Now I'm going to stretch the clay out again. I use plastic ribs. I use metal. Very rarely do I use metal ribs. I use wooden ribs. Um, I use most of the time I use those because when I was an apprentice I used to use this really really sharp metal rib. I loved it during the time but I also didn't like it because I love the feel of the plastic rib and the wood rib on the side of my pots. Oh, Cobalt's finally found the bed. I mentioned her name. Now she's going to think about it. Cut underneath. And cut through. Um, Kyle, so uh, Maureen's writing you back, I believe, right now, but I will answer that question for you. No question, but well, I'm going, going to make it into a question. I started as a painter, ended up as a graphic designer for a quite a while, and ended up as a potter. All of those traits have helped me do what I do. The difference is when I look at Maureen's lines, she has a movement that goes from thick to thin. I was taught how to make a line even with a pen that was uh, your regular nib pen. So we had to draw with those a straight line without it wobbling. So the thing is, yes, you could have been a painter, but it will help you as you go throughout. And you probably don't even need to hear this from me, but I believe that it will also, if you started as a painter, those, those things will help you as you go further into your pottery career. So you may have been persuaded, but it is also very helpful. You also have to support the director because she controls the TV. There we go. Again, take the rib. So think of this. In the colonial era, people were making pots. In the Middle Ages, people were making pots. All throughout history, clay and clay pottery has been a part of the human element of who we are. And mugs have been around forever. However, in the colonial era, the fun part was a mug could be turned into a colander or it would have been a measuring cup. The, uh, the way they used things just depended on what they needed. And they only made X amount of forms and just changed them as they were doing their, doing their job. And potters would work in enclaves of groups because they would do what is called wood fire. So think of living in a, a circle real early before the manufacturers of pottery and they would live near each other and have one kiln and they would share it because it takes multiple multiple people to fire up a kiln. Now the one thing about a round 
mug, you can get the space on the bottom too small. So you don't want to do that, because if you do, and you put the handle on it, it tips to the handle. Or if it hasn't tipped to the handle yet, when you put your liquid in it, it will tip to the handle. So make sure if you're making pots that have uh, nice round shapes or shapes where the bottom is small, that it doesn't get too small, that it will tip over. And handles are very important to a mug. Um, handles are made to feel comfortable to the hand. Uh, the shape will tell that. Every potter seems to make their handles differently and every customer likes a different handle. So if you make mugs and that, one of the most difficult things to do is make a handle. So think about what you're making and how that handle will feel when you pick it up. Uh, a lot of people just make a handle and just say, oh, I can't make them, so I don't want to spend any time on it. I made a lot of bad handles before I made some good ones. And even when I thought I was making really good ones, uh, over time, I learned to make even better handles. Am I finished learning on making handles? No. It's a lifelong, long learning curve. I was watching a video, the uh, YouTube the other day, of a Chinese or Japanese potter making handles. And he made five different types of handles um, that were made with a cloth. And he would smooth them. He braided them. He did all kinds of things to make the handles. Um, I watched a potter named Button, who was from the 19... 50s when an English TV where he was making a jug handle and he threw the jug and put the handle immediately on the jug. The jug wasn't thin, it was very large, but that's how they would have done it because it was meant to be a functional, usable, disposable pot. They weren't meant to be kept around forever. Teacups and saucers, which would be the Wedgwood type things with handles, they had engineers design those so that they had the perfect shape and form that when you picked up that little tiny four ounce teacup, it would feel comfortable in your hand. Now these are definitely not going to be four ounces of liquid. These are going to be more like 12 to 14 ounces of liquid. You remember the part way earlier on I said potters, things are always in variation. One day I pulled just a pinch more. The next time, eh, they're just a little tinier. 90% of the time though, I believe they're always around 14 ounces. So you could make handles by extruding them. You could make handles by pulling them. And you could make handles by making a mold. Now there was this guy named Bernard Leach who used to say, if you make a, a mold of something, it never changes. So you lose that human part of your pot if you do it that way. I love that sound when the clay twists like a flat tire. The other thing too, when you're a potter, a lot of people center clay. And again, I will repeat this probably 
a lot um, is they take their hands and they bend them backwards and they push on the clay. Uh, it causes carpal tunnel if you keep doing that. Potters do enough damage without helping themselves because it's hard work. This is weight. This is tonnage. So you want to keep your wrist more like this when you're centering the clay so that you don't break your wrist, which puts a strain on the, the tendons in that and the muscles. I guess I must have scared Carl off. He hasn't asked a question in a while. Oh, my director is uh, directing now. Uh, yes, Fred. Uh, yes. Uh, the question is, what kind of clay do I use for mugs? Well, the clay I use is called a stoneware clay. So it's a blend of clays that is made, makes it up. So think of clay coming down a riverbed that starts with a primary clay, like porcelain clay. It will go downstream and it starts to pick up other metals and materials that are in the periodical table of elements. Oh, by the way, if anybody's wondering, pottery is science. Periodical table of elements is way in the back. It might be that shiny object you can see back there. Um, and it picks up materials. So one of the materials turns clay into fire clay which is the fire clay is a yellowish brick color. And that's kind of a stoneware clay. It loves heat. It really loves it. That's why they use it in fireplaces. So that clay goes further downstream, picks up more materials, and it becomes saturated with iron, and that becomes earthenware clay. I'm using the one in the middle. So my clay is a blend of like fire clay, porcelain clay, and some other types of clay. So there's blends of clays to make up a stoneware body. And that's what I use. Now the clay is formulated by its materials to go to different temperatures. So there's these wonderful bricks they make. Uh, they used to make them for NASA, that fire brick I tell, said. That fire brick used to be used when the rocket went off to go into space. So every time they fire off those rockets, it melts the base and they have to reline it. So they used to have to dig it out and put new more bricks in. Now we have this thing called kaolin, which is like fiberglass that we use for insulation in our house. And that's what they use there. But if you take those materials, like I said, fire clay, ball clay. Ball clay is a clay that makes the clay more, more pliable. Uh, and porcelain clay is a drier clay, but it likes heat, lots of heat. So all those clays are mixed together to make up a stoneware body. And they come from different parts of the world and different parts of the country. So when we make pots, like I make a stoneware clay, and the company that makes my clay is located in Ohio. And they're also located in California. That's where the clay mines are. So in the mountains, they dig out clay. If you live in Georgia, a little small place down south, they end up digging up a lot of porcelain clay. So the people who used, I used to work at a little, um, a historical museum called Strawberry Bank. And when I was there, I would meet people from all over the country and all over the world. And I got to tell you, it was so much fun. Um, they would tell me stories. And this one guy said he lived in Georgia and he wasn't really originally from Georgia. But he said, yeah, we have this wonderful roads and they're all white on the edges. Well, he lives in the counties where the porcelain clay is. So by the side of his road, 
is porcelain clay and the powder. Well, if you live in another little tiny state, it's called Oklahoma, and you go in certain parts, it looks red. It's like dried red clay, and that is where it's a lot of earthenware clay, but all states have red earthenware clay. What makes up uh, clay is granite. So granite is the primary source or a felspheric rock that makes up what we use. So think of erosion and think of millions and millions of years or millenniums to wash away from the granite this powder. So if you think of the cliffs of Dover in England, they're white. Well, that's the granite being eroded and in Devon, that area around there, they were digging up porcelain clay for the potteries that were up in Stoke and Trent. So they would ship the clay, but Stoke and Trent was noted for the coal. So they moved to where the coal was to fire their pots. So I, in the long term, the question you were asking about where, Fred, where the clay comes from or what the clay is, this is kind of our history. We, uh, clay is everywhere. You can find it in your backyard. If you're in New Hampshire, which we are, you got to get through the rocks first. After you get through the rocks, you might find some clay. But if you live on one of those mountains a little not too far from here, um, I heard from some people, they try to have gardens and they have to bring everything in because the mountain has a lot of red clay on it. So it doesn't grow a lot of plants. So they're constantly adding materials to make um, their uh, flowers to grow and that. There are trees that love to live in really, really bad soil. And that's one of the really cool things is that area is full of trees. But those are the trees that like that kind of dry, arid, ground. So that also plays as well because clay comes from materials that are that iron part that makes the red earthenware clay. Those materials get broken down from organic materials and they leave the minerals behind. Uh, one great thing is uh, I used to say if you go to a swamp you can see how clay is made or a marsh. Because over time, the clay filters through and the land starts filtering and slowly, like I believe it's Brentwood, no, yeah, Brentwood, uh, they have lots and lots of sand and lots and lots of clay because New Hampshire was mostly covered by the ocean at one point. And for some reason, there's this really great piece of property out there where the guy can dig up a lot of sand and he finds clay veins every now and then. And it's like Philadelphia cream cheese. Now, if you live in Portsmouth, where I am, our clay is really sandy. And that's because we're near the waterfront and the sand mixed with the clay. So to use those clays, they would have had to remove the sand from the clay, or they would have gotten clay from somewhere else and mixed it with it. So Portsmouth bricks have a tendency, depending on where you are, will depend on the type of brick you had made in your town. Originally, all towns made their own brick. Uh, over time, we found a thing called railroad, and that changed the way everything was made. Also, most of the brickyards and potters were always near waterways. One of them is called Puddle Dock. There was a Portsmouth at Strawberry Bank. It is called Puddle Dock. It's an inlet that was used for commerce. But if you go to Connecticut, there's a town there that has also an inland place of water that is called Puddle Dock. And theirs had a glass company on it. Uh, Suncook had a glass company, and there was some porcelain clay around there. Glass is the same thing as what we make pots for. They're just mixed differently to turn clear. Oh, wait a minute, that's my glaze. My glaze is glass. 
It's just on the surface. So if you think of the Egyptians, they made glass. And they made it out of a clay that was in a certain location. And they used it by melting it. And they made a clay shell to hold the surface of it. So they made a stick or something that would hold the heat. They would put the, a powder around it. They would melt that. And then they would clean out this soft shell of clay. And lo and behold, you would have this little infora that was used for perfume or something. And they made big pieces as well over time. So clay is, the materials of clay are everywhere. What we're watching right now, what we're working with right now is made of clay. Our computers, our phones, everything that has electronic devices need the clay to, heat, to take the heat. And that's what clay does. It loves heat. It loves fire. It is a wonderful material. I think there's this thing called mica. Uh, that you find in sheets in different parts of different states. And in the 1930s and 40s and earlier, if you owned a furnace or a stove, they didn't have glass. They had mica. And you could look in and you wouldn't see your food, but you could tell the heat was on. Because they had a the little peephole that had a little mica on it, and it would let light come through and it wouldn't melt. Well, guess what? Clay has mica in it because it breaks down smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And it has material. So the chemistry of clay uh, is fascinating. There are people who are engineers and they spend their whole life studying clay. That little um, um, a really fun story for me is just before we got this wonderful covering for our cell phones, I met a guy from Corny who said, we just were able to bend glass and it wouldn't break. Well, that's that shield that is on the outside of our phone that protects the glass underneath it so it won't break. That's clay. High, high, high tech clay. Other materials, he wouldn't tell me the formula. I tried. They won't let me have this information takes away all the fun for potters and glass blowers. But in another hundred years, it may be out there. And who knows what artists will do with it then. Well, that was the long-winded way to say that answer to that question, and I hope it did answer that. Keep going, guys. You're doing great with the questions. You're good with the comments. The director is busy answering everybody's questions that are writing to her. Uh, keep her busy. The dog is finally taking a nap, which is a good thing. But she'll get energetic around. No, she's a hound. When she goes to the beach, she'll go get energetic. Oh yeah, if you want to be a potter, I do have one recommendation. You got to love to get dirty. If you don't like getting dirty, I would not recommend being a potter. There's a few occupations in the world where you have to get dirty. Uh, this is one of them. By the way, if you're a painter, um, it used to be said to me by one of my professors, uh, Don Lee, when I first started to paint, he said to me, uh, to the class, if you have any clothing that looks like it is your best clothing, like your great suit, whatever dress, you name it, he said, one day you're going to find paint on it. It's sneaky. And he wasn't wrong. So even painters get messy and dirty. The arts are one of the few things where you can't completely stay clean.
Okay, going to push on the bottom again. So you can see if you're making a mug, you need to make multiple of them. If you make your living at this, and a lot of my students do, um, that you can't make three of them. You have to make a lot of them. And also, the more you do it over and over again, the more they look alike. Now, some days you wake up in the morning and you have a bad hair day. And it's not a, uh, it's not a lot of fun, but you keep working through it. And you may not have anything by the time you're done that day. But that's okay, because the next day you come back and you will. Because you've learned something from what you did. And that's what counts. Oh, by the way, I will keep talking. If you have a question, it could change the subject. Just let me know. Okay? I have never been told that I don't know how to talk. Is there any more questions, Mary? No, I would tell you. Ooh, okay. Director says there is no questions. She is doing a great job back there. Now, I believe we're doing three more days of demoing. We may be on intermittently on the days not, but uh, I believe it is Tuesday at 1 o'clock, Thursday at 1 o'clock, and Saturday, the last day, which would be the 8th, for us, for us, uh, will be at 1 o'clock. So we try to give some consistency of our time for you to be able to see us. So if you have, if you have a question that you want to answer during the week, you know, write us. We'll be more than happy to answer it. If it looks like it really is a great question, that we can throw out to the whole world, we'll mention your name. We won't use last names and we won't use the town you live in. I believe that's how they do it on the radio, but we will answer that question for the group so that people can see it. If you're multiply visiting us, uh, that will be fun too. So they'll be ongoing, like today was mugs. Uh, I don't know what'll happen on Tuesday. It'll be a surprise. I believe Tuesday is going to be Maureen demoing, um, or part of the time, sure. then part of the time it could be me. So if you write questions with that, I'll probably read them out loud to Maureen, and she will answer your questions. And then you can compare how we answered the same question if you ask that again, because Maureen may have a totally different answer. But I think she would agree, pottery is chemistry. You know? Yeah. And most people I know who work in pottery love chemistry and love math. Or not. Yeah, you got you. Yeah. By the way, there is no physics in pottery. There's no uh, measuring in pottery. We don't use weighing scales. Everything is done by eye. Uh, that would be my dream. There was a guy in the 1700s or in the late 17 or 1800s named Tucker who was up in a little town near uh, Concord and he, uh, or around that area, or, and he was making a glaze and he was using grams to make it and he finally got it and he said, voila, I now have my glaze and this was in his diary. And then he said, now I got to make it by the shovel full. Because his employees were not trained in grams. Because remember in the 1700s, reading, writing, those things weren't as big as they are today, which is really great because we really need the reading, writing, and math and all that to do what we do. But he had to do it by the shovel full. Well, I met a gentleman at, uh, at Strawberry Bank who used to work in... Uh, oh, what was the town? New London, I believe, or is it? Yeah, in Ohio. 
and he made clay for a living. And he said to me, it was his summer job from school, and he made lots and lots of money that summer. He would never ever do it again because it was the most dustiest job he ever had to make clay. But he did it by the shovelful. They would say to him, three shovels of this, two shovels of that, and they would mix it together and it would be on a conveyor belt. And somebody else would add something else. And that's how they made the clay. So we haven't come far from that. Here's a question. Okay. Ellen asks, do you ever swish your piece on the wheel reaching across to clean your hands? You mean like that? <laughs> no, never, never. Nope, nope, no, because it's too messy, you know? I wouldn't recommend it. It's yeah. time delayed, so any second now I'll get to see it on the, <coughs> on the video. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh oh, the face is all lit up, I guess. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen her reaction, oh, wait. but it just got to her. Oh, okay. We're, we're, Maureen and the director and I are talking in a time delay, so a few seconds from Ellen, now, Ellen you're going to hear us. Ellen sent a laughing face. <laughs> <laughs> Potters mess up all the time. I wish it didn't happen. And it never happens on the piece that's not the one you think is great. It always happens on the thing that you really want to keep because it looked the shape looked really good, everything about it. So I believe our time is winding down, yes. and if you have a question before we wind down, let me know, and I'll make that the last question of the day. I believe the League is doing a whole bunch of uh, demos throughout the week and other craftspeople. So, What'll be fun is if you watch these artists or craftsmen, whatever you want to call them, you will get different opinions, different thoughts, different ways that we work. But we're all here for this week doing our craft. And we will all miss you uh, up at Sunapee. Uh, but hopefully next year, uh, we will all be back there in a new format in a new way, making our wares and showing you who we are and what we are, and maybe we can answer some of those questions again in person. Yep. Now, this is my last pot for the day. I thank you all for joining in and being a part of our very first uh, virtual session uh, and with live. And we hope to be doing more, again, like I said, on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Maureen Mills, Master Potter, Master Educator, Entrepreneur, most wonderful, magnificent potter will be on. I will not build her up anymore. By the way, she has no idea. Okay, so any question before I say goodbye? Oh, Ellen asked, why is your bucket there? My bucket of water? Yeah, why do you put it there? Because uh, it's easier, it's easy to reach for the bucket of water in front of me or I would put it on my side over here, but this is where I'm lining up my pots. So it would be in the front. Your, it isn't your usual setup. No, my normal setup is standing up. Uh, when I'm a potter, I, I stand up to make a lot of small objects. When, uh, when I make bigger objects, I sit. Uh, this is the best location to be able to do multiple pieces. I'm gonna throw moon jars on Tuesday. Oh, I just heard, I got a rumor. Maureen is going to throw moon jars. 
This should be exciting. The last time I had to wear gloves. So it should be exciting. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Look forward to Tuesday.